Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Both joined by Derek Young and Drew Galloway. We are here to talk a little bit about our Big 12 preseason ballot, which they were due yesterday, so they went in. I'm sure that you've seen some people toss them out there. I know that the one guy in Arizona, he had, he had KU winning the league, but only one player on either of his all-conference teams, and it was Kobe Bryant, who's, uh, you know, I think on most of our ballots, but he's a defensive back. Uh, if KU is winning the Big 12, Jalen Daniels and or Devin Neal is going to be on that all Big 12 team and more likely than not, probably one of the receivers too, like Lawrence Arnold or something like that. So uh, you can you can kind of roast us for that. We'll hit on the major things today, though, and really probably the number one place to start is what everybody's interested in, and that's who is going to be number one in that Big 12 preseason list that comes out. Uh, Drew and I have talked through this over the last couple of weeks, and we've basically come to the conclusion I think we're going with K-State. So when I got D-Wise this morning, I was stunned because this man has been downplaying over the last five months what K-State will be able to accomplish this year. I was guaranteeing that we would see Utah or Arizona at the top of this list. Well, there it is in all its glory. Derek Young, he has the cats at the top. So before Drew even gets to say a word, I think D.Y. has to explain himself as to how he was able to make the decision after basically teasing everybody the last couple of weeks. Ah, oh, it's not going to happen. It's going to be really tough for him to win it. Why is K-State number one on your Big 12 ballot? I think they have less question marks than KU. And I, and I know it's happened before, but typically – new teams entering a league where they basically have to learn everything about every other team struggle in that first year. Um, I think we saw it this past season, to be quite honest, for the most part. I know Missouri, I think, is probably the exception. I think Missouri and even Texas A&M when he entered the SEC had some instant success. Um, But just about every other example has been contrary to that. So I think it's probably going to hit Arizona the hardest, but I think there is going to be a curve for even Utah as well. And to be honest, and and I've stressed that too, even though I've downplayed K-State a little bit, don't want to like just say they're a foregone conclusion to win the Big 12. But even Chris Kleiman was talking about how they have four or five teams this year that they have to learn about for the first time. So I think it'll be across the league a little bit just because you, you're introducing eight new teams in a span of two seasons. So it's not just, you know, the new teams entering. It's also the Kansas States of the world that have to play Cincinnati, Arizona State, in Colorado, and BYU all this year, teams that they're not typically playing. But I think it'll hurt the teams entering more than the teams that have already been in the league for a while. Yeah, I, th- I think that's fair. And Drew and I have talked about this, but – so much of this is also just schedule-based and, and who do you have to play and how does it work out. The The thing for Air, for Utah is they do have a, a tougher schedule in some respects because they go to Oklahoma State and they do play Arizona. They're at UCF. So they are going to see probably three of the top six teams not named them. Uh, when it comes to K-State, we know that in Big 12 play, Really, the only top teams that they're going to face are Oklahoma State and KU, and both of those are at home. So that is a benefit to them. Arizona, you know, you throw them out there. They're, they, it's a new coaching staff in addition to going into a new league. And so you've got a coach making the jump from the group of five level, new program, in a transition. It does seem like that might be tougher for them. So we're all pretty much – Roughly in agreement with how things shake out, Drew and I both have Utah second, but D.Y., you like Oklahoma State, and I know uh, that that's probably because of your love for Mike Gundy and yep. belief in him. And, and their schedule again, and their schedule again, because like you said, they get to host Utah, but they also yeah. don't play KU or Arizona. Yeah, that's fortunate. Now, Drew is the highest on UCF out of us. He's got the Knights third, so I'll let Drew explain his logic on UCF being picked third. You know, to be honest, it was more of like a, a vibe base with the schedule. I just think that UCF schedule, like we talked about it on the show that we did last week, where UCF schedule, like you can look at it and they could be like 10 and 2, 11 and 1. And I don't think that any of us would really kind of blink an eye uh, it, because you look at it, the only team that they played in the top 
I guess they played two teams near the top, and they're both at home with Arizona and Utah. So you could look at that and say, okay, that's maybe 11-1 and one if everything goes right. And kind of in how I did this, it was kind of like how you did, Mason, where I, I said, if you're one of the top seven teams that I, I think you really hit your ceiling, mm-hmm. and if you're one of the bottom seven, you probably hit the floor. So I think that it was more of like, a, I think that this is where their ceiling is because their schedule is not very daunting at all. I mean, they could easily stumble into 10 and two and be that team that kind of comes out of nowhere. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I could see that and you're right about the schedule. That's a part of it that like that last game of the year at home against Utah on black Friday is probably going to be big. I just, I've been a UCF doubter throughout this whole process. I don't think KJ Jefferson is as good as some are making it seem. I don't think that, you know, they're, they still have quite a few problems from last year to work out, even though they're really good in their running back room and they do bring in uh, a quarterback that is no doubt better than anything they got last season. I'm just, to be honest, I was like, I think one of the three of us have as well, I was kind of talking UCF up at one point. And despite doing that and liking their schedule, I just, you know, at the end of the day, I was looking around and I just liked, six or 17 is more than them. I don't, I don't know. I'd like, I think the continuity factor, look, I don't think continuity is always a good thing. Um, like if you bring back a bunch of average players, you're probably still going to be an average football team. We've said this about Cincinnati basketball. Now how everyone's jumping their bones this year, Yeah. but I still think Iowa States probably get a higher floor than UCF. So that's why I would put like an Iowa state over them. I would put an Arizona over them. Arizona and KU just have so much explosive potential. They could win the league. I don't think UCF can win the league. Um, Utah and K-State the same way. Oklahoma State as well. And then, obviously, you guys see there, my dark horse kind of being Texas Tech. Look, I know that sounds weird, but they bring quite a bit back. We know that they recruit probably among the best of the remaining teams in the Big 12. And they're probably due for some good luck just because everything that could go wrong last year for Texas Tech did go wrong, and they still won seven games. Yeah. So if they even get a touch of good luck, this could be a dangerous team that shocks some people, in my opinion. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll explain myself real quick on KU third. I, I think, look, this is KU might have the largest gap between what their floor and their ceiling is in terms of if we're talking spots. Because, you know, like uh, a team like Colorado, I, I don't think their ceiling is all that high. I think it maybe it's like getting to that sixth spot or something. Um, but I think that there are so many teams that are far lesser than them in terms of talent that they'll probably be right in that 10 spot, as most of us seem to, to agree there. But KU has a fairly easy schedule. And then in addition to that, like if we're banking on guys – playing to their peak, Jalen Daniels, Devin Neal, Daniel Highshaw. Uh, they get Arnold and Skinner back at receiver. Like, they're going to be solid there, and they do have good pieces on defense. Like, that's why I put them up there, and I, I think that they could reach it. Now, the only thing that could hold them back is the offensive coordinator situation is really interesting and, and kind of exciting to see how that will play out throughout this season because it could bring them down a couple of notches. But – they end up not getting kind of our consensus top five. DY has them just outside the top five, but the, yeah, the teams it. that the teams that do uh, that do keep the, all of us have them in the top five of the league. K State, Utah, and Oklahoma State all make it in there. Uh, those seem like the teams that most universally people are agreeing. Hey, they've got a chance to go out and and be a real contender for this league. And I think it has a lot to do with just the top end talent that's on the team. Like there there's depth, but there's also the idea that these guys have players that are proven, or we expect to be some of the best in college football, whether that be cam rising at quarterback for Utah or also Ollie Gordon, obviously could be a Heisman winner at Oklahoma state. And Avery Johnson's got those expectations, but then probably more importantly than the players, you pair that with three coaches that are, universally respected throughout college football right now and Kyle Whittingham, Chris Kleiman, and Mike Gundy. Uh, so it makes sense that those guys are right there. And, and we're lower on Arizona probably than mm-hmm. what the consensus will be when the actual Big 12 preseason poll does come out. But not to speak for you know both of you, 
I think for us, it's a, it's probably what a combination of a new league and a new coaching staff that still has some things to prove. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like if if Jed Fish was there, I think I think there's a realistic chance that Arizona is in a lot of people's top threes based off of how everything goes. But they still might. Yeah, yeah. But you, you changing coaches is not like an easy thing to do. And the one benefit is Utah has already jumped leagues with Kyle Whittingham as their coach. And it's not just like it was an insignificant jump. They were jumping from the Mountain West to the Pac-12, and they still won eight games making that jump. So they only they only got two games worse going from 2010 to 2011 when they jumped from the Mountain West to the Pac-12. Um, and it took a little bit of time there, but you're not working with the same talent gap now. And so I think they'll at least have some background and idea of, hey, we'll be prepared for this. And they're just so good that I, I don't know that you can count them out. But I do think it's probably a, a it's worth mentioning to other people that if you're thinking of putting Utah number one or voting for them, maybe you should consider that they may get deemed a spot or two just because they are having to move leagues. And at the end of the day, there's going to be a lot more familiarity for what K-State and Oklahoma State see or Kansas than what Arizona or Utah see when they're in this league. You yeah, alluded. The, the, Go ahead, Drew. I was say, the thing that really kind of brought me to the pause with Arizona was just looking at, okay, what, what does their schedule look like? And it seemed like every single time that I looked at, like one of their harder games was on the road. So you kind of feel like they're probably due for like a two, three losses there. Because, I mean, they go to UCF, go to Utah, and then – that game at TCU might be kind of interesting near the end of the year too. Yeah, certainly. What I was going to say is you see more and more people kind of, you know, through social media posting their picks um, from their big 12 ballot. There's an interesting number that have KU number one. I, I don't, I think, I think we might see KU in that top three or four. Yeah. I think there, I mean, there is, there's just, the, the thing that should give people serious pause about KU and Utah is that their quarterbacks have not been healthy. Like, that's a really tough thing to try and figure and out. And they're Jaylen, mysterious injuries. And Jalen Daniels is seemingly um, unhealthy again right now. It happened again. Like, those rumors about him being shut down because of shoulder soreness. And yeah. for me, you know, you take out the questions, KU is probably top – three top four in the big 12 but those are just real questions that i have that i can't look past in combination of not having any codal making now you yeah. could say the same thing about k-state and i have colin klein but i think avery johnson kind of shores up some of that and you added dylan edwards in the offseason and you're you replace the the offense coordinator with a guy that's been on staff and then also another guy that comes in that's proven in terms of the quarterback world where We've talked so much about Matt Wells and, and how he developed Jordan Love at Utah State. Uh, one final thing about the standings that I want to point out here. We have a consensus bottom three. The order varies, but we all think that Arizona State, BYU, and Cincinnati are the worst teams in the league. And very quickly, that highlights why K-State is so That's high here. That's because three of the last four games. <laughs> yeah, K-State plays those three teams this year. Um, so that, <laughs> well, BYU is the first league game, but yeah, oh, Arizona yeah. state and Cincinnati are there right, at, right at the end, back to back, I believe back to back home games before the road trip to, to Iowa state to end things. So if we go through this and look K state based off what we have, they play consensus bottom teams outside of the top 10 or lower. So Colorado, Houston, Arizona State, BYU, and Cincinnati. And then D.Y. is low, low, low on West Virginia. He's got the Mountaineers at 13. Uh, Drew and I, it's not like we're high. We have them at nine, kind of middle of the pack there. Um, but that is the, all those teams are on K-State's schedule, and that is why this is really such a big season for K-State and why they should be able to capitalize and why they're getting our first-place votes here because they have the talent, they have the coach, and they have the schedule – that should produce at least a team that's playing in Arlington this year. Like I, I don't, I can understand why they wouldn't be able to make it. You're trying to break some guys in, but now the way things are trending and the way things are set up for K-State, it would be a disappointment. I think if they don't make it to Arlington, at least. Yeah. Arizona Probably. State goes to K-State in November with how bad that we think they could be. That game could get ugly. 
Yeah, no, it's it's probably I, I can see that. Um, we're really different on West Virginia, as you alluded to. We have the same teams in the bottom three, and I believe generally the same teams in the top six or seven. Although there's some ranging opinions in Iowa State, UCF, and Texas Tech, but we're really different on Baylor too. Yeah, and Baylor, I'll say this: Baylor is kind of the wild card. Uh, tomorrow, Drew and I, we, we'll talk about uh, kind of our all our other all Big 12 picks and everything else that go along with it. But Baylor is an interesting one because I think that there is a, a pretty good space where they could be towards the bottom. I'm not a Dave Aranda guy, but they could also be towards the top because Daquan Finn is such a wild card for us. And like I, he he's my my pick for Big 12 newcomer of the year, mm. but. That doesn't seem to line up, obviously, where I have them. It's just – it's going to be such a weird thing to figure out. But Baylor, there is a lot of variety, and I would not be shocked if Baylor kind of turns things around and plays better this year than we thought. It would have made more sense for me to have picked him for newcomer yeah. year, but, but it didn't even cross my mind. I actually picked Dylan Edwards just because I don't know that there's a lot of newcomers in a position yeah. to have such an impact as he will because he'll have the ball in his hands. Yeah, oh, yeah he's yeah. going to have the ball a lot. I went newcomer to the league, so I didn't know if I beat him. Yeah, I saw that. Drew, we'll talk about that tomorrow, Drew. I oh, look, I agree with you. I totally agree with you because I said during basketball season, if the Big 12 was legit, Jamal Shedd should have also been newcomer of the year, and he didn't get it because apparently, even though he had never played in the Big 12 before, you know, he, he wasn't a newcomer because his league. Yeah. You should be newcomer of the year. I agree with that. I totally agree with that. You're right. And if you're not going to honor that, then technically Dylan Edwards shouldn't count, right? Because he came from Colorado. <laughs> yep, great point. Very good point. <laughs> also, All right. Well, oh, go ahead. I was going to say fullback also needs to get kicked off the list. I did yeah. not include a fullback. I yeah. put not D-Y, available. DY boycotts the fullback <laughs> spot. He's he's a real you know beacon of change. All right. We'll get out of here. Drew and I will talk more about uh, our votes. We'll talk about individual players tomorrow on the KSO show. So for Derek Young, Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. We'll see you later.